everybody in? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the, our last session of the day. I hope you've had a good uh, uh, day with seeing our various people. I think we had some pretty spectacular uh, opportunities to learn things. I certainly learned a lot today. And I think we're going to learn quite a bit this afternoon from Carl Rove. Uh, Carl Rove, I don't really have to introduce him. I'm sure you all know of Carl Rove's uh, uh, work over the years, particularly as a uh, advisor and operative for uh, various Republican politicians. Uh, what I did learn that I didn't know, there were 75 of them he's advised, some of them uh, kicking and screaming, no doubt. But he's had a tremendous career in Republican politics. He's also a very much of an academic and a deep thinker. He wrote a wonderful book on McKinley, which I recommend to all of you. Uh, and I just think he's, I just thank the world of him. I've known him for years and he's a good friend. Carl, you're back there somewhere. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Tweed. Actually, I came to uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, via McKinley, actually, or sort of maybe it's the other way around. I was a, uh, teaching in the uh, LBJ School of Public Policy at the University of Texas at Austin, the only Republican member of the faculty, proving God does have a sense of humor. And uh, I was teaching an undergraduate class in the uh, Joint Appointment of the Government and Journalism Department, and uh, the head of the department came to me and said, you know, uh, you don't have a PhD, and if you want, like, we'll, uh, we'll fast track you for a PhD. Uh, there's only one problem. You're 44 and you have to get your BA. I lacked uh, math requirement, science requirement, and since I'd only run a public relations, public affairs firm for 18 years, there was no evidence I could string two sentences together, so I had to fulfill the upper division writing requirement. Now, I was a little busy. It was uh, 1995 and 1996, and uh, George W. Bush, governor of Texas, was thinking about running for president, so I had a little bit of time uh, spoken for already. So. I looked in the course catalog and found History 351, Seminar and Historical Source Writing. All you had to do was get a professor in the history department to take you on, do research in the original material, and the, you could get a paper, write a paper and get three hours. I had no idea that it had never been given. It was in the catalog, but it was just sort of a placeholder that had long ago fell out of disfavor in the history department and nobody did it anymore. So I showed up in the history department. The, uh, woman manning the counter asked me why I was there. I explained. She told me that nobody ever did it. I said, well, how do I, how can I get it done? She said, you have to have a professor take you on. And so I said, great. Who's around? She said, there's only one professor in today, Lewis Gould. I had no idea who he was. I had no idea that he's one of the great historians of the Gilded Age. She said, took me in to show him. He sort of vaguely knew who I was, Austin being a relatively small town. And uh, he said, what do you want to write about? I said, I'm really interested in Theodore Roosevelt, 1895-1896. It's the bottom of his political life. He uh, has been in Washington for six years as the U.S. Civil Service Commissioner, and he's on the outs with the New York Republican machine, and he backs the wrong man for president, doesn't think much of the guy who wins, William McKinley, and yet somehow or another ends up as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and without it, we were unlikely to hear of Theodore Roosevelt on the global stage, the international stage, the national stage, the presidential stage, unless somehow or another he works his magic in the election of 1896. He said, great, that's exactly my era and I'll take you on. All you have to do though is read the McKinley papers. Promise me that you'll read the McKinley papers because history gets McKinley wrong. I wrote a book as a result about McKinley, but an interesting character in it is Theodore Roosevelt. The election of 1896 is studied by political scientists as one of the five great realigning elections of American politics. There are five moments that political scientists have identified where the American political system is one way before the election and distinctly different afterwards. The election of 1800, the end of the Federalist era and the emergence of the Democratic Republicans under Thomas Jefferson. The election of 1828, the emergence of the modern Democratic Party and the election of the populist Andrew J J Jackson. 1860, the emergence of the Republican Party. 1896 and 1932, the election of FDR and the emergence of the New Deal coalition that lasted durably for about 50 years. 
We study four of those elections by looking at the winner. Jefferson, Jackson, Lincoln, and FDR. One election, though, we look at more the loser, William Jennings Bryan. And we look at it as amorphous, anonymous forces of urbanism and industrialism working their way through a modern electorate that's changing, an America that's becoming more city dwellers and fewer farm people. And we sort of look at it through that prism and ignore the really interesting character is talking about a very big issue, the issue of currency, in a way that engages the public that's hard for us to grasp today. Turnout in the North in many states reaches 90 percent. We're lucky in a presidential election to get to 61 or 62. And yet in the North, an electorate that's far less educated than modern America, nine out of every ten people come out to vote. Because it's a very interesting story. And I wrote about it in my book on McKinley, which has got sex, violence, backstabbing, betrayal, and really cool nicknames. <laughs> Everybody had a cool nickname. The Republican nominee for president is called the Napoleon of Protection, and the Democratic nominee is called the Boy Orator the Platt. But one character who doesn't have a nickname is Theodore Roosevelt. He's a very interesting character. In 1895, we find him as the police commissioner of the city of New York, chairman of the police commission. But without his actions in 1896, that may have been the last that we heard of him because he's on the outs with the New York Republican machine. Back then, the Republican Party in particular were run by political machines and political bosses. On the Republican side, they called themselves the Combine, and they were led by former Senator, New York Senator Thomas Collier Platt, who was called the easy boss because of his affable manner and easy, uh, easy manner. Some of his key lieutenants were the blonde boss, 32-year-old Congressman William J. Larimer of Chicago, who starts out as a 22-year-old uh, streetcar conductor who shows up at his Republican polling place. Back then, they, the parties were responsible for ballots, so you showed up at your precinct place, and you ask for a Republican or Democratic ballot and then, and then cast it. He shows up at his polling place and there's nobody to hand out any Republican ballots. So he goes to the adjoining precinct, scurries up with enough ballots, hands them out, but is furious that nobody has organized his precinct. He's 22. Two years later, he has organized the precinct. In fact, he's organized the entire second ward of Chicago with a group of like-minded young Republican men and turns it from a Democratic stronghold into a Republican stronghold and is rewarded with a seat on the Cook County Republican Central Committee. Two years later, he's turned it into such a powerhouse that he has made the superintendent of the, excuse me, he's given a job in the water department. He continues his political labors and two years later becomes the head of the water department with 10,000 patronage jobs at his disposal in the city of Chicago and the Cook County surrounding area. He gets himself thereby elected chairman of the Republican Party of Cook County, made a congressman at the age of 30, and by the age of 32 is the undisputed boss of Illinois politics, blonde boss. The chief operative of the combine is James S. Rhett Clarkson, publisher of the Des Moines Register. His nickname, Rhett, comes from the fact that he had terrible handwriting. So whenever he sent an editorial down to be written up by the uh, to be set in type by the, the composers, he would put at the top of the copy, R.E.T. Clarkson, return to Clarkson. So he would make certain that they interpreted his handwriting correctly in the editorial. They write each other coded letters. I stumbled across one in the library of Yale, where Platt's papers are located. Platt has received a letter from Clarkson who says, I need a pyramid this week and a pagoda next. There's so many code words in this, particular, uh, in this particular letter that Platt has taken out his code book and written above all the code words what the, what the English word is for it. I need $3,000 this week and I need $5,000 next was what Rhett Clarkson told him. Money is always present in politics. But Roosevelt's on the outs with him. He's been a rambunctious figure in New York politics and he's irritated Platt. And he's yet desperate to have a political career. He's not going to be nominated for state office. He's not going to be nominated for governor. He's not going to be nominated for assemblyman. In fact, in 1895, he confides in his friend Henry Cabot Lodge, I can't even get elected to the National Convention as a delegate from my district. I'm so on the outs. So the only hope he has is to back the right man for president and hope to God that he wins. <laughs> 
and then ask him for a job in Washington. That's the only way to resurrect his career. And what he does is he lines up with the front runner, Thomas Brackett Reed, Speaker of the House, Republican of Maine, six foot three inches tall, 300 pounds, looks like a bowling pin with a walrus mustache painted on it. And he's sort of the favorite of people like Roosevelt, but he's also the favorite of the bosses because the bosses are very practical men. They want to win. And they want to win by getting behind somebody who can win in the general election. But they want to get behind him in a way that indebts them to the bosses. So what they generally do is, is nobody really would have a campaign for the nomination. You'd show, sort of show up at the convention, and what they would have done is either bound delegates to them by their force of personality, as in the case of Matthew Quay, the boss of the Pennsylvania party, or they would run favorite sons, sort of somebody in their state who would be sort of uh, everybody would feel a loyalty, state loyalty to, and then at the convention they get in the proverbial back room, literally the back room, smoke-filled back room, smoke cigars, drink brown drinks, and cut deals. And the deals would be over the control of patronage in their state. They wanted the authority, the power to name people to post offices, and particularly the port collector of New York, who got paid not a salary, but a percentage of the tariffs that he collected at the, at the port, and thereby it was a very lucrative position. So as you go look through the Gilded Age, you'll find that Republican political figures inevitably either control or end up I I as the actual port collector in some of the major ports in America. The port collector, for example, of the port of Galveston, Texas, then the second largest port in America, is the Republican National Committee man from Texas, Norris Wright Cuny, tall, articulate, attractive, and black. And he is, the re he is the wealthy Republican leader in Texas because he's the port collector and the second most lucrative job in the federal government after only the New York port collector. The bosses are inclined to read because they think he can win. And so is our man, Theodore Roosevelt, who makes himself useful by doing what he does, which is scribbling. He writes articles in influential magazines in 1895, like Century and, and, and uh, Scribner's, on behalf of Reed, making the argument as to why the Republicans would be best to nominate Reed. But in his own home state, he is so out of favor with the bosses that he is not allowed to speak to the Republican convention. He is forcibly told by the henchmen of Senator Platt that he will not only not be allowed to speak at the Republican state convention, but he will not be allowed to speak to any, quote, regular local Republican committee, one dominated by the bosses. So he occupies himself uh, during this time by speaking to uh, the reform Republicans and by speaking to nonpartisan groups who are in support of his work as the police commissioner, principally his work in stopping German saloons from operating on Sundays. Back then, New York was not as open to weekend activity as, as, it, as it is today, so saloons were not allowed to serve liquor on Sundays. But the Germans, always devo devoted to having a beer after church, uh, had illegal sub, uh, uh, saloons open, and so Roosevelt made a habit of leading the police in raids on the German saloons. The uh, state committee voted to uphold the Sunday liquor law, but the New York County, Manhattan Republican County organization came within one vote of formally censuring Roosevelt for his nefarious work in stopping the Germans who leaned Republican from voting from, from uh, drinking on Sunday. By the end of October of 1895, Roosevelt writes his great friend Henry Cabot Lodge, quote, I have no real standing among the party managers and I have too much support from the cranks, the anti-drinking crowd. Lodge is his great friend. They've been friends since they met in Washington years before. And Lodge is the campaign manager for, Senator, or for uh, Speaker Reed. He was a member of the House. He's now a new member of the United States Senate from Massachusetts. And he cautions Roosevelt in, the, in, in late October not to get more public in this battle with Platt. And Reed has, excuse me, uh, Lodge has two reasons that he doesn't want this to happen. One is he doesn't want Roosevelt to burn all of his bridges with the machine. He says to come out and denounce Platt is simply playing Platt's game. And to respond to Platt's henchman, who's the chairman of the New York County Republican Party, a guy named Lauterbach, he says, quote, he's pretty small in the state and absolutely unknown outside of it. So his point is, don't get involved in an unnecessary argument. 
But he's got a second reason that he wants Roosevelt not to get in a fight with the machine. And that is, is that the New York Reform Republicans, who are Roosevelt's natural friends and allies, are starting to coalesce not around Thomas Brackett Reed, but about around the reform candidate for president, William McKinley. And Platt is signaling that while he can't come out for Reed publicly, he will never be for McKinley, and he is, uh, uh, he's open to being for Reed if Reed will make accommodations on patronage. So Lodge doesn't want his great friend Roosevelt to get in a pissing match with, with uh, Platt because he wants Platt to be in favor of his candidate for president, Speaker Reed. By mid-December, the governor of the state, Republican Levi P. Morton, is up so upset with what uh, Roosevelt is doing to endanger the support of the German Republicans and by his support for Reed that he is um, he's pressuring him to come out for him. He's basically saying, if you come out for Reed, I'm going to make certain that the police commission is thoroughly destroyed and you're discredited. So by the middle of December of 1895, Roosevelt is writing his great friend Lodge saying, basically, I'm going to have to support Levi P. Morton out of uh, loyalty to my state, and uh, I hope Reed will understand because eventually Morton is a favorite son, stalking horse. He has no chance of being the Republican nominee and will swing in behind Reed at the convention. The problem was is that this assumed that Reed was going to win, and while he was the front runner, something started to happen to him when the Republican primaries back then con mostly conventions started happening in December of 1895 in Louisiana. That was the Iowa of the 1895-1896 election. And surprise, surprise, McKinley started winning. And it started in the South, which really surprised the bosses. The Republicans in the South were by and large poor and black. They had one quarter of the total votes at the convention and, pre and proceeded to give the Republicans zero in the general election because the black Republican vote in the South is wiped out, being wiped out systematically by violence. So they have half the delegates needed to nominate, a quarter of the total delegates in the convention, no stroke in the general election, but vital to any presidential candidate because they had that many votes in the nominating process. And McKinley has done something that has never been done before. Typically what happened is the bosses waited until the convention came around and up showed these poor, mostly black delegates from the South, and they bought them off. They paid their hotel bills. They, paid, they gave them railroad passes to get to the convention. They gave them money, and they gave them promises that if their guy won, they'd get him a postmaster or a job at the, uh, a job at the uh, port or somehow take care of him. And this had worked for 30-some-odd years. And the bosses had controlled the Southern Republicans uh, in this manner. But McKinley did something very unusual. In March of 1895, he took a vacation. He went to Thomasville, Georgia, which was then sort of like the Palm Beach of that era. Palm Beach had just been founded and nobody went there. But Thomasville in the southern part of Georgia was where wealthy Midwesterners and wealthy Northeasterners had winter homes. It was at the side of three rail lines crossed at Thomasville, which made it easy to get there. And during the winter, literally, there was a daily train from New York. And what had happened is, is one of McKinley's great supporters had, had a home there. He invited McKinley to come south, and the two of them invited all the Southern Republican leadership to come and visit with McKinley at the home of his friend in Thomasville, Georgia, white and black together, which was unusual. You generally dealt with the black Republican leadership at a distance through intermediaries. But here was a man who was running for president who treated the white and black Republicans as equals, brought them to this town in southern Georgia, treated them as equals, asked for their support out of friendship, and bonded with them. McKinley becomes the first presidential candidate of either party to make an address in front of black audiences openly asking for their votes. He does so first in Jacksonville, Florida, and then in Savannah, Georgia in March of 1895 at the behest of men that he had met when he invited them to visit with him as friends and equals in Thomasville earlier that month. So by the end of 1895, unbeknownst to the machine, they had lost the South. Platt later said it was gone before we even knew it was up for grabs. So starting with Louisiana, 
and then going throughout the South. McKinley is winning the delegations that the bosses were counting on to be able to swing in behind their, their choice. So by the time it gets to March, Theodore is beginning to worry about his man. He writes his sister by a letter, quote, Reed has missed his opportunity, has merely succeeded in getting the idea that he has been tur he's turned timid on the question of whether the, gold, uh, whether the currency ought to be gold-backed or silver-backed. He, if he had, quote, declared outright against free silver and had given no room to the free silver Republicans who had used currency as an excuse to, appoint, appoint, uh, to defeat a tariff measure, he'd be ahead, but he isn't. By April, there's a hope for a resurrection of Reed's chances. They're coming up to the New Hampshire Convention and the Illinois Convention. Illinois is the major battleground of the Republican nomination fight. It's called the Gettysburg of the contest by one of McKinley's advisors. The two conventions are held back to back. New Hampshire is expected to be a big victory for Thomas Reed because it's right next door to Massachusetts. And Illinois is under the control of the blonde boss. So it's thought to be a sort of one-two punch that would deal McKinley a blow and stop his momentum. But instead, New Hampshire falls to McKinley in a surprise by an overwhelming majority. And then in, in uh, Springfield, Illinois, the next day, the McKinley men deal the machine a two-to-one defeat at the state convention. Their efforts are led by a 29-year-old youngster named Charles G. Dawes, McKinley's uh, Illinois campaign chairman, and all of a sudden the contest is over and Roosevelt's man has now been defeated. There'll be a convention, there'll be a battle at the convention, but the battle at the convention is going to be over whether we, there is a solid gold plank in the platform or the, whether there's one that equivocates. There's no chance of there being a silver plank, but the race for the presidency is over and it's pretty clear to everybody that that's the case. The Republicans meet in early June in St. Louis, Missouri, and it rolls out just like you might expect. There's a convention credentials committee. There's one last desperate attempt by the, by the machine men to overturn the convention by challenging delegations left and right. Of the 900 delegates to the convention, nearly 300 of them are challenged, virtually all of them by the machine men, and they think they have a shot to win all these credentials challenges because the, the Credentials Committee is the Republican National Committee itself, which was elected four years before when they were solidly in control in 1892 of the convention. But instead, the McKinley men are so well prepared and so well organized that on starting from the very first vote on the convention's uh, credentials challenges, they're in complete and masterful control. And by the end of the convention's uh, credential meetings, the chairman of the convention committee for Reed the, the Republican National Committee man from Maine named Manley admits to the press, even before the vote has begun, we've lost and McKinley will be the nominee. The morning after the convention closes, Police Commissioner Thomas uh, Theodore Roosevelt shows up uh, at, the, uh, at the police commission, quote, the local, local newspaper said, wearing an ivory-colored button as large as a silver dollar with a picture of the Republican ticket on it, William McKinley and his running mate, Garrett Hobart of New Jersey. Roosevelt boasted to the reporters that this was, quote, the first of its kind in New York City. A few days later, he writes on June 20th a letter to his, to his, favor, to his treasured sister. Darling, bye. While I greatly regret the defeat of Reed, who is in every way McKinley's superior, I am pretty well satisfied with the outcome in St. Louis. We have an excellent platform on almost every point, finance, civil service reform, foreign policy. Only the pension plank is bad. McKinley himself is an upright and honorable man of very considerable ability and good record as a soldier and in Congress. He is not a strong man, however. And unless he is well backed, I should feel rather uneasy about him in a serious crisis, whether it took the form of a soft money craze a gigantic labor riot, or danger of foreign conflict. Several days later, he writes one of McKinley's closest personal friends, former Congressman Bellamy Storyer of Cincinnati, Ohio, and says, we must do everything we can to elect McKinley. And when he is elected, you must be at least the Minister to France, if not the Secretary of the Treasury, and my ambitions, such as they are, can go by the wayside. 
A little bit different than the tone he had just a few days before. And the reason is serious. He wants a job. He wants to resurrect his political career. He had pinned his hopes on Reed, and now the only chance he had was to somehow ingratiate himself with William McKinley. Storia was his friend from his days in Washington. Storia was very close to McKinley. When McKinley got into a bad situation financially by having signed some notes for a friend that got called, Storia was one of the men who had helped bail him out. And Storyer's wife, who really had the political juice in the family, Marie Storyer, liked Roosevelt a lot. So he knew that he had to get in with McKinley. And he knew McKinley didn't really think the world of him since he, Roosevelt, had helped Thomas Reed beat who for Speaker of the House? William McKinley. So the Democrats then hold their convention. But before they do, the Republicans are extremely confident of victory in the fall. After all, the country's in a terrible depression. The country is bl blaming it on Grover Cleveland. The Democratic Party looks, um, it looks like it is on the verge of disavowing Cleveland by passing a platform that literally censures the sitting Democratic president of the United States. So Hannah announces that he's sort of tired and he's going to spend July and August and into September on a vacation on his yacht up the East Coast into Canada. Then comes the Democratic Convention in early July in Chicago, Illinois. The battle is between the front runner, William, excuse me, uh, Congressman from, from uh, Missouri, Richard Park Bland, the leader of the Free Silver Forces within the Democratic Party, men who call for the coinage, uh, for, for, for money to consist of gold and silver, with silver uh, coined at a ratio of 16 to 1 with gold. Hard for us to understand, but this is what 20 years in American politics has been fought over, and this is the man who has led the fight for what he calls the cause of humanity itself. His nickname is Silver Dick, and he's the front runner. The other man who's running against him is Uncle Horace. Horace Boys, the former Republican turned Democrat governor of Iowa, the only Democrat to be elected governor of Iowa since the Civil War. There's another guy out there who thinks he's a candidate, a young former congressman, two-term congressman from Nebraska named William Jennings Bryan, but he is the only person who thinks he's a candidate. On the eve of the convention voting, the night before the convention begins, the publisher of the Denver Post happens to run into Bryan, William Jennings Bryan, and says to him, who do you think will be the nominee? And Bryan says, I've got as good a chance as anybody else. I have Nebraska on the first ballot, and I have been promised half of the Indian, Indian Territory on the second. And the publisher, a man named Patterson, goes away and writes in his diary, I've just met an insane man. In fact, nobody considers him a candidate until he stands up and gives a speech at the end of a two-hour-long debate about silver, the silver plank on the platform. The New York Democrats are leading a fight to a futile fight, and they know it, to stand up on behalf of a gold-backed currency, an idea that has been solid democratic orthodoxy going back to Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson. And they know they're going to lose, but they're going to make a show of it on the floor on behalf of this great principle. And by accident, seven, not one accident, but seven accidents, William Jennings Bryan is given the chance to give the final speech. But it's accidents, total accidents. Somebody said, well, let's have him be the temporary chairman of the convention, but his delegation was under, under challenge, so he couldn't be elected temporary chairman. While they're, while they're battling over who ought to be the chairman of the convention, somebody says during, a, during some downtime on the floor, let's ask that young guy from Nebraska to give us a speech. But he's in the credentials fight. It can't be, can't be when the Mississippi delegates say, let's have William Jennings Bryan give us a speech while we're wasting some time here. He's nowhere to be found because he's in a credentials meeting. They elect the permanent chairman of the convention. Well, he, he, would, he, he could have been elected permanent chairman and sort of semi wanted to be. But they said, you know what, he's not, you know, we don't want to favor him. We, we want somebody who we can count on. He's really nobody. Let's elect somebody else. A whole series of these. 
the chairman of the platform committee, rather than closing the debate himself or even speaking during the debate on this, says, you know what? He hasn't had a chance to speak. Let's have him speak. He's supposed to speak at the beginning for 15 minutes, except the guy who is senior to him says, oh, no, no, I want to speak first, and I want to speak for 50 minutes. So he's given a chance to close the debate. He's supposed to speak for 15 minutes at the end of the debate, but as the debate is going on, one of the gold men is spending extra time speaking, and one of his fellow gold speakers says, you know what, we've got to have more time to speak. I can't speak in five minutes. I need 10 or 15 minutes. Let's add 15 minutes. Let's all agree we're going to add 15 minutes on to the speaking schedule. And at that point, literally 15 or 20 minutes before he's supposed to begin to speak, William Jennings Bryan is told, you won't have to speak for 15. You get to speak for 30 so he stands up at the end of this two-hour-long debate in an unair conditioned auditorium on the south side of Chicago. 25,000 people are sitting in the arena, and they're sort of getting bored, so they're starting to get up and start to leave. When, when they announce that we got one final speaker, and up jumps William Jennings Bryan, who nobody has heard of except the Nebraskans. And he begins to speak. And Josephus Daniels, editor of the Raleigh News Observer, later Franklin Roosevelt's uh, Navy secretary, a young journalist, begins to write. He's sitting up in the rafters, and he begins to notice that people are starting to pay attention. And as this young man stands up there, humbly begins, I come here not to speak uh, on behalf of myself, but to speak on behalf of a great idea, the idea that, that we need to have a currency that's inflationary, that rebalances the relationship between the government and the little man. And he begins to talk about the little man. Daniels is sitting next to a farmer who almost got up and walked out at the very beginning of the speech, but, but sat down when he was introduced and began to listen intently. And then Farmer got more and more enthusiastic. And, and at one point, uh, re, uh, Brian begins to talk about the difference between the big man and the little man. And he says, the farmer who, who, uh, who farms 160 acres is as important as the man who trades grain upon the stock exchanges. He says the corner merchant is as important as the merchant who holds forth from, a, from an office in a big uh, metropolitan city. He said the man, the miner who goes a thousand feet into the earth to dig out the metal is as important as the man who trades gold and silver futures upon the great markets of the world. And at that point, the, the, the farmer stands up and begins to yell, oh my God, oh my God, as this crowd is going nuts. And then, of course, we get to the final end where Brian, after 20-some-odd minutes, 25 minutes of speaking, says you shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. And when he says that, he says you shall not press down on the brow of labor a, cr a, a crown of thorns. He ha holds his hands to his head as if he's bleeding from the thorns. And then he says you shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold, holds out his arms, the entire audience is completely stone quiet. He drops his arms to his side, begins to walk off the stage thinking he's been a failure because there is literally nothing from the crowd. And then after two or three beats, 25,000 people go stark raving mad. And 36 hours later, he is the nominee of the Democratic Party on the fifth ballot of the Democratic Convention. And no one 24 hours before, 36 hours before in that hall, very few people had ever heard of him. And suddenly the American political scene is completely turned upside down. Because here is somebody who can articulate the message of gold and silver in a way that benefits the silvermen in a very powerful way. All of a sudden the Republicans are in deep trouble. Back then they didn't have polls. They had surveys. But what they meant by a survey was they literally had precinct chairmen go door to door, door to door to door in their precincts and report back to the county chairman who reported to the state chairman what people's attitudes were. And the news, particularly in the, in, in the Midwest, is very, very bad. One quarter of the Republicans in uh, Iowa are now supporting the Democrat for president, which would be a devastating defeat in a, in a state that had never voted Democrat in a race for the presidency. And this is throughout the West. In Minnesota, they recruit a former popular Swedish Republican congressman to run as the Democratic nominee for governor. Left and right, the Republicans are seeing defections, and they realize suddenly that somebody has done something to upend American politics, and they got a race on their hands, and by the end of August, they know that they are behind. In late July, 
the campaign chairman for the Republicans, Marcus Alonzo Hanna, comes to New York. Why New York? You know about the concept of battleground states? Florida, North Carolina, and Ohio, and Pennsylvania? The biggest battleground state in the Gilded Age was New York. If Republicans won New York, they won the presidency. If they lost New York, they lost the presidency. And two other states were followed New York in its train, Connecticut and New Jersey. Whatever way New York went, they went too. And along with Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, these were the major battleground states of the Gilded Age presidential politics. Now in this year, 1896, we're also seeing Republican defections in Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Nevada, Idaho, Montana, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, and Nebraska. All Republican states, but all of them up to grabs because of the silver controversy. What is money to be constituted of, gold or silver? Gold being seen as the representative of the Eastern financial strength of the Wall Street and the moneyed power, and silver being seen as the currency of the common man. And so the Republicans had a problem, and they needed to first make certain that they carried New York. So on the 21st of July, Hanna shows up in New York. He's met by two people, Frederick Dent Grant, Roosevelt's compatriot on the police commission and one of the people suing him as police commissioner. By 1896, Roosevelt, who started out in 1895 loving his job as police commissioner, has come to hate it by the middle of 1896 because he's being sued by all of his fellow police commissioners and then he's being excoriated for actually upholding the state's Sunday liquor law. The other person who meets McKinley, actually meets Hannah there, is William McKinley Osborne. McKinley's cousin, who is a Boston city councilman and has been sent by, by McKinley to be his man in New York at the national headquarters of the campaign. But it's only one of two headquarters, and it's the fake one. The real headquarters is in Chicago, being led now by the now 30-year-old Charles D. Dawes. The New York headquarters is one to basically placate the Easterners and give them a place to come and think about campaign, uh, campaign strategy. And it's located at 23rd and Madison in the Metropolitan Life Building. After he picks out the headquarters that afternoon, Hannah meets the press and immediately makes two mistakes. He says the only issue in this campaign is going to be the tariff, when everybody knows at this point the only issue is currency. And then second of all, he insults the easy boss, saying when asked, are you going to see Senator Platt? He says, I may see Mr. Platt. Quote, I may see Mr. Platt which is like, I don't care. Now, Platt may have been the easy boss, but he was a prickly personality, and he had just been insulted by this little punk from Cleveland who was taking New York for granted. So what happens that night? Mr. Roosevelt begins to show his mettle and his utility. Hannah has dinner with Osborne, West Virginia Republican U.S. Senator Stephen Elkins, and Theodore Roosevelt, who proceeds to tell him that he needs the machine's help to win New York. If he loses New York, McKinley loses the election. If he wins New York, he has a shot at winning the election. And the way, the only way he can win New York is by placating the easy boss and getting the support of the regular Republicans. After dinner, Roosevelt writes Platt a letter. He did not write that letter without clearing it, in my, in my opinion, with Hannah. And, the, and you can tell from the tone. I do hope you can arrange to see Mr. Hanna while he is in New York City. I think, you have a big, I think we have a big fight on our hands. We need to st strain every nerve if we want to win this struggle. New York's important. You're important. Hanna would like to see you. This is on a Tuesday. By Friday, Hanna has been cajoled into writing a personal handwritten letter that is hand carried to Senator Platt saying, can we meet? Platt responds, I am at your disposal. We can meet when and wherever you want. The men meet within an hour. And afterwards, Platt emerges with a smile on his face because he likes what he's been told. He's been told that, one, the issue in New York will be the currency issue, not tariffs, and two, that the regular Republican organization will, will be in charge of the campaign in New York, just as Roosevelt had said it must be 
And uh, he tells the, tells the reporters that this is what the agreement is and jokes about it and mocks Hannah by saying, quote, I've been washed in the blood of the lamb. Roosevelt writes his friend Lodge and says, close one, but we got it done. He said, Hannah, quote, feels rather sore with Platt over the convention in all likelihood and the battle over the convention plank and wasn't inclined to call on Platt first, but he did. So Roosevelt shows he's a pretty good practical politician. He takes the guy who hates his guts, Platt, and recognizes that he is critical to the election of the guy that he doesn't think much of, McKinley, but whose election is critical to Roosevelt's having any chance at all of rescuing his political career by getting a job in the new administration. This is the end of July. Early August, who shows up in Oyster Bay? But Bellamy and Marie Stoyer. She later writes that Roosevelt, recognizing that she's the smart one in the pair, takes her out in a rowboat on Long Island Sound and, uh, and rows her around. And she says that uh, Roosevelt rowed like he spoke, spasmodically and sometimes absent-mindedly. But he pours out her heart. She says, he said, there is, quote, one thing I would like to have, but McKinley would never give it to me. I should like to be Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And knowing that McKinley's not particularly enamored with him, she says, you and Bellamy are the only people who can get me this. Now, he did go out of his way to say, I, I, I don't want to do anything that would put me in conflict with any desire that Bellamy might have to go into the cabinet. But that was an easy thing to say, because Bellamy is from Ohio. And if you're a president from Ohio, the likelihood of you having significant number of cabinet members from Ohio is slim and none. And slim is cinching up his horse at the very moment that we're talking. But he knew the way that he had to have an ally inside McKinley's inner circle, and Bellamy was the man. He writes Bellamy a couple of days later saying, as I won't work, I suppose it would be very well for me to accept the assistant secretaryship of the Navy in the very improbable event, event of my being offered it. But I do not want you to concern yourself about the matter. Sure. First, because it is too early. Sure. And second, because the really important thing is to get you in the cabinet or in Paris, which is baloney. But it shows that, again, when time, came, when time was required, it, Roosevelt could be, a, a, could be an ambitious young man on the make. Shortly thereafter, uh, Brian shows up in New York. He's going to accept formally the Democratic nomination by coming into what he calls the enemy's country. It's at the train station in Lincoln, and he says, I go into the enemy's country, just the kind of positive and optimistic tone you want to start your campaign with. But that's how he came to New York, in a speech in Carnegie Hall. But rather than repeating the fantastic experience that he had in, that people had by watching him in Chicago, he pulls out a giant speech and proceeds to methodically read it. And it's considered to be a complete and unmitigated disaster. Uh, Roosevelt was attentive to it. I don't know if he was actually in it, but he does say Brian fell with a bang in a letter to his sister. And a week later, he is in attendance when a Tammany Hall Democrat named Burke Cochran shows up to give a reply on behalf of, of gold Democrats to Brian again in New York City. His, I'm sorry, his is in Carnegie Hall. Brian's was in Madison Square Garden. And Burke Cochran is there, and Theodore Roosevelt is in the crowd, and writes both Lodge and his sister about what a fantastic speech this was by Burke Cochran. Burke Cochran, as an aside, is this incredible figure of the Gilded Age. He's a Tammany Hall Democrat. He has uh, not, the pictures of him are not particularly, you know, exceptional. But when he opened his mouth, he apparently had this voice that was magnetic. And he exuded charisma. Men wanted to be his friend and women wanted to be his lover. In fact, he had a lover. She was an aristocratic widow who lived in Paris. And she had, uh, they'd begun their relationship in 1894. And in 1890, October of 1895, her 19-year-old son spent a month with Burke in his New York apartment before heading to Cuba as a war correspondent. In April of 1896, 
Burke broke his leg, and so he left for Paris to recuperate in the arms of his lover. Something happened, and by August the relationship had broken off, and he, uh, he uh, left to come home, and when he was uh, approaching New York, he let it be known that the press ought to show up at the wharf, and when they did, he got off the boat and said, I'm a Democrat, I will always be a Democrat, I'm a Tammany Hall man, I will always be a Tammany Hall man, but I'm also an honest money man. I believe in the gold currency standard, and I will always be a gold currency man. And therefore, as a Democrat, I will do the extraordinary thing of endorsing William McKinley for president, and out of my own pocket and at my own expense, I will travel the country and urge other like-minded Democrats to join me in supporting McKinley. Now, this is an era where this didn't happen. This is like John Conley. 1972 coming out for, you know, the, the protege of Lyndon Johnson comes out and supports the re-election of Richard Nixon. This is never heard of. And he gives the reply to Brian at Carnegie Hall. The speech is reprinted all across the United States. In fact, it's even reprinted in London, where the son of his former lover writes him a, tele writes him a letter and says, what an extraordinary speech. I hope it will have the effect that you that you desire. It was an extraordinary speech. All the best, Winston Spencer Churchill. In 1946, Churchill gives the famous speech in Westminster, at Westminster College in Missouri that an iron curtain has descended across Europe and an American admirer writes him a letter saying, you're the, be you're the, most, you are the, you are the uh, most outstanding orator of the 20th century, the greatest orator of the 20th century. And Churchill writes him back and says, no, I'm not. Everything that I learned about the use of the English language, how to hold thousands in thrall, I learned at the feet of my mentor, Burke Cochran. little side note for the Churchillians among you. Well, Roosevelt leaves for, his, for a vacation, heads off to go hunting in North Dakota. But on the way, he does what any ambitious politico does. He stops at the national headquarters in Chicago, goes around and introduces himself to everybody and says, I'm Theodore Roosevelt from New York and I'm happy to do whatever you would need me to do. And I think we're okay in New York now that I've helped put uh, Hannah and Platt together, but I'm available. Let me know what I can do. I want to be of service to McKinley. They don't take him up on it. But he is impressed with what Dawes is doing. The 30-year-old Charles Dawes is literally producing campaign literature by the car, train car load. In fact, Roosevelt goes down and watches them load a train car full of pamphlets to send to a state and writes his sister, Quote, the educational work done about finance by the distribution of pamphlets has been enormously telling. He returns after the vacation through Chicago and writes Lodge that, he's, that they're beginning to think that the Midwest is starting to come back. And he's given a minor assignment. On September 11th, 1896, he gives a speech in New York to the Commercial Travelers Sound Money League. These are traveling salesmen. And the speech is entitled Cash and Credit. And he begins to talk about the silver issue and the gold issue in a way that is not seen from the, from the position of the, of, the, of the stock salesman or the financier or banker. He starts talking about it in the way that an ordinary working man would talk about it. McKinley's talking about gold and silver, but it's like he's Wall Street. A country needs to have a sound currency. In order to be seen as a country to be lent to, we have to have a currency that's good as the currency that we borrowed which means we need to have the currency like the rest of the world has. That's not what Roosevelt says. Roosevelt says, quote, free silver would not give the working man any more money than he has now. He'd, quote, have the same number of dollars as he does now, but only worth half as much. He has two loaves of bread. This is the loaf that a gold dollar can buy. It's a whole loaf. Here's a half a loaf of bread. This is what a silver dollar could buy. The working man deserves to be paid in a currency that allows him to feed his family. Interestingly enough, language like this and language from another similarly minded individual, Terence Powderly, the mayor of Scranton, Pennsylvania, and the former president of the Knights of Labor, the largest labor organization in America, they start to show up in the speeches of William McKinley. McKinley's smart enough to read these things and say, you know what, this is better than how I'm talking. In mid-September, shortly after the speech before the traveling salesman, Lodge writes Roosevelt and says, I've been invited by the Republicans in the state to campaign through western New York, since it's a battleground state that want to have speakers come in from outside the state. 
and I'm going to be coming and campaigning throughout the western part of New York, and I want you to come with me. And he says, don't say police to me. This is more important than police. In other words, you can step aside from your police commission duties for a couple of days. He has no idea that this is what Roosevelt has been waiting for. He desperately wants a chance to go out on the campaign trail. So the two men spent five days going through, uh, north, uh, through the northern part of the state. They campaigned in, in uh, Utica and Buffalo and Jamestown. Only the headlines are never the United States senator from Massachusetts. The headlines are all Theodore Roosevelt. And why? Because Roosevelt takes a two-by-four to William Jennings Bryan. At one rally, accuses Bryan of, quote, holding principles sufficiently silly and wicked to make them fit well in the mouths of an anarchist leader. He assails, in another place, he assails Bryan for class warfare, a borrowed cry heard in Paris which resulted in the horrors of the commune. All the headlines. He goes to Lake Chautauqua. He says, says Bryan, who spoke in the very same place in August, he says, this is a fight against, quote, government of the mob and for the demagogue. He talked about a recent ferry ride where a drunken Democrat stood up and told everybody on the ferry, if Brian gets elected, we'll get rid of the yachts. What would be the next object of Brian's, Brian's class warfare, Roosevelt asked. His victory would, quote, work much more evil than the successes of the rebellion Lincoln had ended. Worse than the Confederates. As a result, those are all the headlines. Not the quiet, thoughtful, precise, measured speeches of Henry Cabot Lodge. At the end of it, the two men are invited to go to Kent and, and, and meet the major, McKinley himself. John Hay, their mutual friend, is very uh, touched by this, tickled by it, really. He writes Henry Adams a letter saying, H and T have been invited to Canton to offer their heads to the axe and their tummies to the Harry Carey knife. They're supposed to abase themselves in front of McKinley. He said, McKinley had invited me to watch the spectacle, but I had thought I would not struggle with the millions on his trampled lawn. But they go and pay their obeisance to their respects to McKinley. And who else is in Canton that day? Bellamy Stoyer. Now, whatever happens, happened. But a few days later, on October 6th, uh, he writes, Roosevelt writes Lodge, I've been invited to go give a major speech in Chicago on behalf of McKinley and to then follow Bryan throughout Illinois and Michigan. The major speech is in front of 18,000 college Republicans meeting in the American College Republican League Convention in Chicago on the, 6th, on the 15th of October, and Roosevelt wrote a speech called The Menace of the Demagogue. In a book of his collected speeches, there are two from the campaign of 1896. One is The Menace of the Demagogue. One, another one is that he gave two days later in Detroit. And they are nasty pieces of work. The Menace of the Demagogue opens with this. It is not merely squirrel girls that have hysterics, <clears throat> very vicious mob leaders have them at times, and so do well-meaning demagogues when their heads are turned by the applause of men of little intelligence and their minds inflated with the possibility of acquiring solid leadership in the country. The dominant note in Mr. Bryan's utterances and in the campaign waged on his behalf is the note of hysteria, and it goes downhill from there. And it is in a very effective, nasty piece of work. Now, during my research, I found out that between the Monday speech in Chicago and the Wednesday speech in Detroit, that our man Roosevelt shows up in Jackson, Michigan, and takes the Monday speech, drops out what he doesn't think works, puts some new material in it to road test it in front of a crowd of 5,000, so that by the time he shows up and speaks to 20,000 people in Detroit on Wednesday, he's got it well perfected, and boy, does he ever. The speech is shortened by a third. It doesn't start as nasty as this. It draws the crowd in a little bit easier, but it's still a very tough piece of work called the Jack Cade and Company speech. Using a, using a Shakespeare play, he quotes about Jack Cade, who in Shakespeare's play 
is a demagogue who makes promises to the ordinary people of England that, quote, when I am king, as king I intend to be, seven halfpenny loaves shall sell for one penny in England. You can get seven loaves of bread for one penny. A pint of beer shall hold a quart. I shall make it a felony to drink small beers. All shall eat and drink at my score, and all shall wear the same livery, the same clothes as the king. Our, he's, and he, uh, Roosevelt goes on to say, Our present representative of the type merely says that we shall have money so abundant it shall not be worth anything. And again, it goes downhill from there. But it does, does do the trick because the afternoon of the speech in Detroit, morning speech is given by Roosevelt, the afternoon speech is given by Brian. And what does Brian do? He spends his entire speech answering the charges raised by Theodore Roosevelt in his speech, thereby mission accomplished. Throw him off his record, throw him off his speech, throw him off his message, and make him respond to ours. The next day after Detroit, he speaks in Monroe. The next day after that, Ypsilanti, Michigan, and then returns home to New York. Makes another speech in, in Baltimore, Maryland, later in the campaign. Makes a few speeches to small groups here in New York. But his good work was done during this week of trail, trailing Brian through Michigan. And then on election night, what happens? Victory. First time in five presidential election years, uh, five presidential elections that a, that a candidate, Democrat or Republican, gets more than 50% of the vote. The Republicans win states they have not win, won ever, like Maryland. States they've not won since the end of the Civil War, like West Virginia and Kentucky. They nearly win Maryland. They sweep most of the Midwestern states and the most important ones, the bigger ones, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin. They hold Minnesota. They keep Iowa. They lose Kansas and Nebraska. They lose most of the Intermountain West, but he wins the biggest victory since, since Ulysses S. Grant re-election, and the American political system is broken wide open. After the election, Mr. Roosevelt it keeps his crusade going. He uh, writes the Stoyers and says, I need your help. Stoyer tells him that he's been to see McKinley and has made a request on his behalf that he be considered for the assistant Secretary of the Navy. Mrs. Storyer later says that when they talked to President-elect McKinley, he said, uh, all right, I'll consider him. But, quote, I do not trust your young man, Roosevelt. He's too pugnacious. By early March, Roosevelt thinks that he's unlikely to get it. He writes a common friend of his and, uh, and uh, Henry Cabot Lodge that, that uh, he's convinced that neither the Platt nor the anti-Platt people of New York feel that I'm a useful ally and is feeling they're quite right. They, they've industriously sought to persuade the president and the Navy secretary designate Long that I would be headstrong, impractical, and insubordinate. Well, two out of those are true. Uh, headstrong and insubordinate, but impractical, no. But by the end of March, he's been rewarded. He writes Lodge, just a line to tell you that the machine people here evidently have it in their heads that I'm to be made Assistant Secretary of the Navy and evidently approve it as a means of getting me out of New York. Harass them enough and they'll be, good to, they'll be glad to get rid of you. And by early April, he's been officially named uh, Secretary and on April 26th is already sending uh, messages to the President of the United States. Now why is this important? Because if we had not had this ambitious young man, 35 and 36 years old during the election of 1895 and 1896, pressing his case so obnoxiously and persistently, trying to find a way, weasel his way in to a camp that, which he thought little of and which thought little of him, to demonstrate that he had utility and, and, uh, and, and could be of service, we might not have ever seen this guy again. Because only when he has made assistant secretary of the Navy can he send the order to Dewey to, to load coal and make steam and head for Manila. And if hostilities are declared and the Spanish fleet attempts to flee, destroy them. He can't resign in a blaze of glory and organize the first volunteers. He can't train them in San Antonio, Texas and take them to Tampa, Florida and have them offloaded in Cuba and charge up Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill and be recommended for the Congressional Medal of Honor. He cannot be mustered out in September of 1898 
and reluctantly chosen by Platt to be the Republican candidate for governor and be elected five weeks later. And as governor of the most important and biggest state in the union, he cannot be considered as the running mate to William McKinley in the 1900 reelection campaign. And after McKinley's assassination in Buffalo in September of, eight, of, two, of 1901, become president of the United States. None of those things are possible unless he does what he does during the campaign of 1896 by finding every moment where he can say, I can be of help to you, Mr. McKinley, even after saying to his sister, I think he is weak. Anyway, an interesting character and an interesting moment, and the rest of his life depends upon it. With that, I'd be happy to answer or duck any questions you might have. Yeah, back, back here in the back, tall man. You said that in 1896 politics, everyone had a nickname, although I presume they were all the nicknames were not made up by the same single person. So I think it's cool that 120 years later, we had a presidential candidate who had a nickname for everybody. <laughs> candidate Trump? Well, I was, I was thinking of George W. Bush, who had a nickname for everybody, but... Uh, but uh, Nicknames were, were uh, you know, were sort of popular during that time. I don't know exactly why, but everybody had them. Uh, one of McKinley's allies and a friend of Roosevelt's uh, was called the Southern Cyclone, the Republican candidate for governor in Tennessee, Henry Clay uh, Moore. So it, I don't know why they had it, but it's a habit that we ought to bring back, at least uh, uh, make them popularly known rather than presidentially designated. What other question do we have? Right down here. What would, what would drive him to be so interested in politics? I, you know, look, I think, like a lot of people in politics, he wanted to have an effect. He didn't want to hold office, he wanted to do things. But he knew in order to do things, he had to hold office. And he had enjoyed his service as a legislator and as a Republican leader. Uh, he'd enjoyed his time in Washington. But he knew that uh, after having been appointed as somewhat of a surprise, as civil service commissioner and then reappointed in a gigantic surprise by Grover Cleveland, a Democrat as civil service commissioner, he realized that he wouldn't be able to do things unless he actually had a, a job that he was elected to. And in order to do that, he'd have to somehow restart his career. Lodge says, oh, you'll be one of the senators from New York when you have a Republican legislature. And he said, I have no chance in hell of being made a senator from New York because I'm obnoxious to Platt and Platt won't allow that to happen. But, you know, he was desperate, and there was only one thing. And, and look at it. Think about it. He has his eye on a job. Why? Because it's newly created, and nobody's figured out how useful it would be, and it was right in his lane, Navy. And he liked, he liked the Navy. He liked the he, – in fact, one of his criticisms of, 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 uh, of Reed is in March, he says, you know, if he'd come out for a strong Navy and coastal defenses, he'd be in a better place than he is today. So he wanted to do things. And, and simply being a naturalist or uh, going on hunts, as much as he liked doing that, was insufficient. That's why he goes on a, on a big safari to Africa. And what does he do after he gets back home? Runs for office for president in 1912. Does he any others? No others. Well, thank you for having me, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Uh, I think he, if he ever runs out of a job, he can be a reenactor of TR sometimes. We'll see you all tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. We'll go directly into breakout sessions. Uh, you, there will be the people waiting for you telling you where to go. So have a good evening, and we'll see you tomorrow.